The Lost Track of Time, Chapter 18. That ninny, that, that twit, the great moodler was looking through her spyglass, furiously trying to focus the lens. Penelope looked up from her moodling. Who's a ninny? Who's a twit? See for yourself, grumbled the great moodler, pointing toward the shadow of doubt. Penelope closed her notebook and got to her feet. She brought out her spyglass and quickly scanned the darkness for anything peculiar. Everywhere she looked, she saw fancies lifting the shadow. A few were speeding toward the realm of impossibility for their next meal. Penelope sent her gaze farther out, this time using the spyglass to follow the line of the horizon. That's when she saw it. Poking above the shadow was a shiny, pointed spire glinting in a sun it had not seen in ages. It's the clock tower, said Penelope glumly. That's not all, replied the great moodler. Look again. Penelope moved her spyglass down the spire to where it met the roof. Clockworkers were swarming all over it. Each clockworker wore a safety harness secured by ropes to great metal rungs high above them. They were inching along the tower's ledge, carrying ladders, toolboxes, and other gadgets Penelope didn't recognize. What are they doing? Penelope whispered, as if the clockworkers could hear her. They're fixing that awful clock, said the great moodler through gritted teeth. Sure enough, Penelope noticed a new glass plate fitted on the clock face. Some of the clockworkers had scaled the side of the tower and were welding the plate in place. Perched on the ledge, Polishing the Roman numerals was a tall, strangely familiar figure. He wore the blue coveralls of the clockworkers, but his long arms and legs poked out well past the hems. Other than his unusual height, he looked exactly like any other clockworker. He had the same blank look on his face, and he moved with jerky automated movements. Just as with all the other clockworkers, a blue hat sat on his head but it couldn't conceal the wild red hair beneath it. Dill, screamed Penelope. Tears sprang into her eyes, and the view in front of her vanished. Her calm was shattered, and the spyglass along with it. She felt the great moodler's hand on her shoulder. He's a clockworker now, Penelope stammered. We're too late. It looks that way, agreed the great moodler, but looks can deceive. Great Moodler pulled up a chair, and Penelope eased herself into it. Her mind couldn't comprehend the truth, but her stomach did. It began to churn uncomfortably. Penelope wrapped her arms around her middle and hugged herself to make the pain go away. How can that be, she said, more to herself than to the Great Moodler. Dill hates Kronos. He would never serve him in any way. Never. Not in a million years. Penelope looked up into the great moodler's sympathetic eyes. Something horrible must have happened to him, she insisted. I can't just leave him there. Nobody said anything about leaving him, dear, said the great moodler. But Dill isn't the only captain. The entire realm of possibility is held prisoner by Kronos. Once that clock is restored, the spell will be restored too. Right now the clock is still broken and we have a chance to help others believe in the impossible. After the clock starts ticking, our chance is ruined. We must help the fancies. But there's no time, pleaded Penelope. Oh, but there's all the time in the world, the great moodler corrected her. Where? Penelope practically screamed. Right here, said the great moodler, opening her arms as wide as they would go. In the space of this very moment, Kronos would have you believe you need to save time. But for what? The only time you can spend is the time you have right now. And the time you have right now is all the time in the world. The great moodler dropped her hands to her sides. Time isn't precious, Penelope. You are. As long as you remember that, you're sure to use it wisely. The great moodler sat down. Now then, let's start moodling. I have some fancies to feed, and so do you. Penelope watched as fancies floated in, they were exhausted from their efforts and in obvious need of nourishment. She sat down and tried to moodle, but images of Dill in those terrible blue coveralls kept coming to mind. In his, is his internal clock broken? 
Does he even remember me anymore? Does he know what happened to him, or is he just a machine? Penelope gave her head a quick shake. She had to stay calm. She couldn't afford to outbreak of an outbreak of worry warts. She pressed her lips together and tried to focus. Dill needed her help. She was sure of it. But if she returned to the tower, she risked everything. She might be captured and turned into a clockworker. If it could happen to Dill, it could happen to her. But the great moodler said staying here and feeding the fancies was crucial. Besides, it was safe here. Even if they didn't succeed in lifting the shadow and the realm of possibility was lost in doubt again, Penelope was back to her old moodling self. It felt so amazing she didn't want to stop. If only she had a little more time. Penelope looked over at the great moodler. She was stretched out with her feet up as if she were sitting on a recliner. Her eyes were closed and bubbles streamed out of her head. The great moodler said, had said Penelope would never have more time. That people were what really mattered. Penelope got to her feet. I can't save time, she thought, but I can save Dill. She walked right up to the edge of the shimmering mountain and stared out over the shadow. She remembered Dill telling her that people used to ride the fancies. All she had to do was capture one and then ride it to the tower. If she moved quickly, maybe she could rescue Dill and be back before the great moodler even noticed. That is, if she didn't get caught. Penelope shuddered. She couldn't think about that right now. A dull blue fancy, about the size of a cantaloupe, emerged out of the darkness, and Penelope waved it over. I'd better fatten you up, she thought, and took out her notebook. She had already used up all the paper, so she turned to the inside back cover. She only had time for one amazing moodle. Penelope stared at the nothing all around her. For a brief moment, she saw it reflected in her own mind. She sat, basking in the nothing, until, pop, an idea inspired by Dill came to mind. She started to write. Mushrooms are a delectable fungus. Some are small, others humongous. They grow on the ground, can be found all around. We'll never starve with them among us. As Penelope wrote, the fancy gobbled up every word. When she was done, the creature chittered in pleasure and did a series of quick somersaults. After each somersault, it landed in front of Penelope, twice the size that it had been before. When it was through bouncing around, it was almost as big as a pony. Perfect, thought Penelope, and glanced quickly over her shoulder at the great moodler. The little old lady was still busy moodling. Well, here goes. Penelope approached the fancy and, with a little leap, tried to mount it. She grabbed a hold of where she imagined the neck might be, but all she managed to do was knock the fancy off the mountain ledge. It let out a surprised screech, but then fluttered back to where Penelope stood. Sorry, Penelope whispered. She backed away to regroup. How can I climb on top of a puff of air? That's impossible. Penelope suppressed a giggle. Of course it was impossible. Everything in this realm was impossible. She turned back to the fancy and imagined a tiny trampoline near her feet. She took two quick steps and a short hop. Sure enough, she landed on a firm but springy surface and shot into the air. She reached for the fancy and, in her mind, its fluff turned to fur. When she grasped the creature, Penelope felt something soft and thick under her fingers. She held on tight, swinging her legs up and over before landing firmly on the fancy's back. To her delight, the fancy lifted into the air and zoomed away, heading straight for the realm of possibility. When they crossed over the shadow, Penelope felt a chill grab hold of her toes and move up her legs. She glanced down and saw the darkness churning like a rough sea below. Doubt gripped her mind. I'm riding on nothing but air. I'm going to drop like a rock. And so, that is exactly what she did. And that's the end of chapter 18. See you next time for chapter 19.